Civil Society unlock and manage EU funding. It's a support programme run by The Wheel, providing information, training, help desk support and network building opportunities. The European Union's new multi-annual financial framework will run from 2021 to 2027 and contains a plethora of funding programmes for organisations like yours. These include education and training, youth, sport, citizenship, rights and equality, research and innovation and the social economy. These programmes will serve the EU's overall objectives of being smarter, greener, more connected, more social and closer to its citizens. Innovative projects undertaken by civil society will play a key role in driving these objectives, but navigating EU funding can be challenging. Join Access Europe today for expert help with accessing EU funding opportunities. Okay, so there's a little bit of an overview of our Access Europe program, um, and we'll give you a little bit more information about that later and the types of supports that we can offer. Um, but uh, the first thing we're going to do is just have a little look at what we're going to cover in today's session. So uh, the first thing we're going to look at is just a very brief overview of some of the basics of how e-funding works. Before we hand over to our co-hosts for this event, the Creative Europe team, um, who are going to walk you through their program and then the other national contact points that we have lined up to talk about the various um, EU funding opportunities that are available to the creative and cultural sector through their programs. Um, so we have representatives from Lergus to talk about the Erasmus Plus program and um, from the Irish Universities Association to talk about Mary Sklodowski Curie actions and Horizon Europe Cluster 2. Um, after that, uh, or before, uh, in the middle, I should say, we will we'll take a bit of a comfort break for about 10 minutes. Um, and then at the end, we'll have plenty of room for uh, some, some Q&A uh, before we wrap up by listing some of the supports that we have available for any of you who are interested in uh, finding out more about uh, EU funding that you learned about today. Um, so with that, we're just going to jump in and have a look at how EU funding works. I'm not going to go into exhaustive detail here because it's really unnecessary. You don't need to know a huge deal about EU politics and policy in order to be able to access EU funding. Uh, but it is good to have kind of a general overview of the process and how it all relates to funding opportunities. It can just make kind of navigating the whole landscape a little bit easier um, and can also help kind of connect the dots so that you can make stronger applications if that's something you decide to go for. Um, so jumping right in, I'm gonna, we're going to look at the multi-annual financial framework or the MFF, which is obviously a much shorter, more succinct way of saying it. Um, you, you often hear this kind of stuff, uh, this terminology kind of thrown around when you talk about EU funding, but essentially it's the, the EU's long-term budget. It runs according to seven-year cycles um, and in, for each budget period, they determine what their goals are. Uh, over that seven years and how they're going to allocate funding to achieve those goals. Um, so you can see now that we're currently in 2021 to 2027. So even though we're into 2022 now, I would say we're still very much in a transition period. There was a lot of delays with the new batch of programs in 2021. Um, some of them, like the interregional programs, are only just seeing their first deadlines being released now and kind of clarity about new programs and how they're going to work is still kind of being ironed out. Um, but there, there are lots of opportunities that will be coming up uh, this year and over subsequent years. Um, and overall, it's a really good time to get involved in EU funding if you haven't been involved already, because the kind of learning that you do and the research that you do into programs now at this, at this uh, period at the beginning of the, of the MFF, will kind of stand to you for seven years. So, um, you know, it's, it's a good time to start familiarizing yourself with the various programs and how they work and what opportunities there might be. Um, in, in, a in, in addition to the, the usual MFF that we get every, every uh, seven years, uh, we've also got additional budgets this year. So there's Next Generation EU, the Recovery and uh, Resilience Facility, and both of them are, are connected with with COVID recovery and, and helping the kind of economy and, and society recover after the pandemic. Um, and then there's also a five billion euro Brexit adjustment reserve that has been awarded 
uh, this year and actually 20% of that will go to Ireland um, recognising that it'll probably be the hardest hit of the various member states. Um, so we don't know exactly how that's going to be spent yet and there's still a lot of kind of negotiation that needs to happen in order to, to kind of figure out how all these things are going to be distributed and used at member state level. Uh, to give you a bit of a visual, you can see that the blue is what the multi-annual financial framework would have been, and then the orange is the kind of extras that we get on top of that for this particular MFF. Um, and you can see that this, these are the kind of numbers that we're working with, so it is a, it's a large budget. Um, in terms of... Let's move on to the next one. No, oh, one second. There you go. Um, yeah, in terms of how it works, so funding program, programs are thematic. So today we're going to be talking about the creative and kind of cultural uh, programs. Um, but you can see there's also ones to do with education, environment, interregional, and they um, act as financial instruments to put policy into action. Into actions. So the programs are released at the beginning of the seven year period, but there are annual work programs there that allow um, you know, allow the, the program coordinators to set different priorities and respond to different challenges and kind of evolve the program throughout the budget period and to set timetables and things like that. Um, so you can see in this graph that essentially policy is what leads to programs. Um, you know, it's policy goals and policy objectives that lead to the formation of programs and how funding is allocated. And that funding then leads to projects. And ultimately, a lot of the projects the findings of projects, the results of projects that are delivered on the ground, often by civil society organizations, but also other stakeholders, are what informs future policy. So it's very much kind of a circular relationship. And it just makes sense that when you are applying for any EU funding, to try and link it back to the relevant EU policy, because that helps to demonstrate uh, how your project will help to deliver on EU policy. Um, and just a quick note that sometimes the budgets might seem very high when you see those, those really high numbers there, but it is good to keep them in perspective. It, it might look like a lot of money, but it's spread across the whole of the EU. A lot of it is absorbed by national governments um, and for things like big infrastructure projects. But there is a push now for more kind of citizen involvement in, uh, in various projects, whether that's interregional projects, research and innovation projects, um, education projects, all of those things, there's more of a, an emphasis on that kind of grassroots connection to communities uh, involvement in projects. So it's a really good time for civil society to start looking at EU funding and seeing how they can be involved. In terms of some kind of core characteristics of EU funding, um, just to have a kind of an idea of what the EU funding projects look like. So in general, it's good to look at what EU funding is and what it's not. So the first thing that it is, is that it's an opportunity to learn and to share, to connect with an influence policy, as we saw from the kind of circular graph earlier, to be innovative, to look at new things. In general, EU funding is not going to fund operational work or business as usual or core costs or anything like that. It's, it's much more focused on innovation, new ideas, new policy or new new collaborations, new initiatives, things like that. It, it can be a real opportunity to fast track certain strategic objectives that you might have um, and to collaborate with external partners. And that's often key and central to a lot of European funding. Not all of it requires partnership, transnational partnership, but by and large, EU funding as a whole really prioritizes that kind of European element of transnational partnership. Um, it's also an opportunity to build the capacity of your organization and your organization's profile. So that's, that's the opportunities that it does present. But to look at what, just briefly at what it's not. So this is kind of a bit of the, the myth busting or the kind of um, letting people know early that if they're looking at EU funding, hoping that they're going to get some quick funding out of it, that's absolutely not the case. A lot of the time you have to wait for the right deadline. It can take a few months to properly build a partnership if that's necessary or, um, uh, you know, right, wait for the right funding call to come out. So it's not a quick fix. Once, even once you do submit your project, it can take a few months by the time it's assessed and by the time grant agreements are in place. So it's not a quick fix. It's not easy. There are, you know, it's uh, it's a challenging um, funding area. It's not impossible, and there is lots of support available, and we'll hear about that very soon. But um, 
you know, it, it is challenging, but it does, you know, that goes hand in hand with building your capacity that, yes, it's challenging and you need to put time and invest time into learning about it. But uh, that extra capacity, that organizational development uh, impacts all areas of your organization and your ability to uh, access and manage grants overall. So it's not easy, but, uh, you know, there's value in investing time into learning how to do it. It's not without risk. Uh, projects are inherently risky. That's why they're projects and they're not operational work. There are a lot of things you can do to mitigate the risk. And that's where the National Contact Points and Access Europe are here to help you, you know, design a good project, write a good project, uh, put together a good partnership if partnership is necessary and try to kind of reduce the level of risk. But, you know, whatever you take on projects, whenever you collaborate externally, whenever you take on new initiatives, there's always going to be a certain element of risk. Um, and as an organization, you have to be you have to be willing to to weather that. Um, it's not core funding, as I said, this is an operational funding. It's not going to keep the lights on and the doors open. Um, mostly, there are some kind of exceptional grants where they provide operating grants, but by and large, uh, you know, when you're looking at EU funding, it's not core funding, and it's also not usually national funding. Now, there are, as I said, some examples where you, it doesn't require EU partnership. But overall, if you're looking at European programs overall, it's important to be open to European collaboration. Um, so that's kind of a look at what it is and what it's not. And just on that point of partnership, a lot of people find that one of the most challenging things to try and navigate. We just did a training last week about partnership and about how to go about setting up, or maybe it was earlier this week, uh, they're all kind of blending into one, but uh, about how to set up a successful EU partnership. Um, so, you know, that's free to access. You can watch it back if that's something you're interested in. But it is a specific challenge. And so in order to kind of um, to, to help with that, Access Europe, the program that we want run here at The Wheel, uh, has, has a few different supports that uh, are available to people to try and help um, them to uh, better kind of navigate the whole EU partnership process, including this partner database that we have. So uh, there's a there's a link there. We we'll send all of this in the follow up. You can have a look at it in your own time, but it allows you to create a profile that outlines who you are, what you're interested in with EU funding, what kind of strengths you can bring to a project. Um, and this it's entered into the searchable database that we market to Europe in the hopes that more and more Irish organizations will be invited into projects uh, because it's a very um, good way to try and get started in the whole process of EU funding is to start off as a partner. So we're trying to do our best to kind of showcase the value of Irish civil society and all the wonderful things that are being done here to Europe in the hopes that it will foster more partnerships. So we'll include that in the follow-up and it's something that's well worth a look at. But with that, that's kind of a, a very quick kind of whistle-stop tour of the characteristics of EU funding, generally how the, the MFF works and how the programmes work, um, some kind of expectation setting in terms of what it is and what it's not. And one of our resources here, which is our partnership database, that's well worth a look at. But that's really all we're going to provide in terms of an overview. There's loads more information out there if you do need more, uh, if you do need more support. But for now, we do want to hand over to our first NCPs and our co-hosts for this event, who are the Creative Europe team, so that they can tell you a little bit about their programme, which is specifically for the creative and cultural sector. So um, over to, I know there's four of them, so I don't know who I'm going over to first. So. Yes, you're, you're coming Great. over to me. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Orla Clancy and I'm with the Creative Europe Desk Ireland. There are four of us here today. Um, we are the Creative Europe Desk Ireland team. I'm just going to share the presentation, so bear with me a second. Um, okay, so yes, thank you, Emma. That was a fantastic overview of what European funding is, because I think that that is the one thing that we find it difficult to to get across to our applicants about, you know, it's one thing about, about sharing the information on your project, but also to get in your head what exactly EU funding is and that it's not like national funding. Um, so once you can get that into your head, so that's a fantastic um, introduction. So thank you very much. Um, we are delighted, we're thrilled to be working with, with Emma and her team at Access Europe um, on this event. Um, we, you know, we're, we hope that this event will, will, will answer some of your questions surrounding European funding for the creative sectors. So we know that, you know, all of you here, you're from the, the creative and cultural sectors and you're very familiar with the funding aspect. And I'd say a lot of your time is, is put into um, trying to access funding for your projects. 
and you're well aware of all the Irish funding resources that, that are out there. And um, we know that the European, sometimes you can, you can see the European funding and it just seems too complicated and a lot of red tape and it, it just feels too much. Um, so hopefully this, this will sort of um, cut through some of that. Um, so Creative Europe, uh, the media and culture programs have been around for many, many years, um, since the 90s, beginning of the 90s. And then in 2014, we, we all came under the um, Creative Europe umbrella. So generally, this is the one-stop shop for the EU funding for the, the sector. Um, but the potential and the opportunities of these sectors um, have been realized and have opened up the doors to many other avenues of funding from other different European programs. So they're the strands of those programs that, that we'll hear today. And, and, we, and we know how difficult it is to keep tabs on all of them because the programs are so huge. So picking out those individual strands for creative sectors can be quite difficult. So, so, so that's why we're delighted to be here today. So to give an overview of the Creative Europe um, program. So we are the Creative Europe desk. So there is a, so sorry, the, I'll go into the actual program now in a minute, but the Creative Europe desk is, um, there is a desk network across Europe. Um, in each country, I think it's in 40, uh, there's 40 desks at the moment. Um, so and we're, we're a very close, close knit, knit network. So in Ireland, um, I'm based in the media office in Dublin. And then Evelyn Nivongola, who's here, is based in the media office in Galway. And then there's Katie, Larry and Eva Tony is in the culture office. And that's based in the Arts Council. So they look after the culture so program um, of the of the Creative Europe program. So then we have Leona Cully, who also so brings us all together with um, our social media and communication skills. Um, so yeah, so, so that is who we are. And I think it's very important to, to part of this is, is sort of introduce us to you all. Um, and our aim, so our aims as a desk is, is one, to give you information about the program, which we are doing today. And we will, you know, we have newsletters, we have, which you can sign up to, um, you know, very strong social media, uh, we run events, um, we, you know, a lot, a lot of information about the program, but also some other um, programs and policy, um, policy objectives too from the EU. We're here as well to develop and advise, like Emma was saying, I mean, we are, you're not alone. When you're applying for, for European funding, you're not alone. So for Creative Europe applications, like we are here, we will get out the red pen with your applications um, and, and bring, you, bring you through to make sure that, that you're on the right track because we want you to, to, to succeed in, the, in these applications. So, um, so yeah, so please always come to us if you have any questions at all, like that's why we're here. So a key area, um, again, what I was talking about was co collaboration across, across Europe. And we know that can be difficult. And especially like, you know, we can't just hop on the train and go to France. Like it, it's, it's a lot more difficult for, for, for Irish partners to do that. So we help with that. So we, um, the desks are, are, are involved at the moment with on certain new calls that we're, we're doing um, matchmaking sessions for partners. We're, we're running events that will, you know, help bring people together and think about collaboration across, um, across Europe. And I know on the culture side, they've been working on the partner search for years. And uh, from the media side, it's, you know, a lot of it would be the, the markets and the training um, opportunities that, that we'll go into later. And also then we promote the results. So we are actively involved in promoting your projects and getting it out to the general public, not only in Ireland, but also across Europe. So the Creative Europe program, budget of 2.44 billion. And it does, it sounds a lot, exactly like Emma was saying, it sounds a huge amount of money, but when you break it down, it's there's many many different calls there's many different deadlines that suddenly the, the the funding starts to shrink and there's an awful lot of criteria that you have so you have to be at a certain level so it's so it's a, it's a lot of work just to get to be eligible to apply so the the program it supports europe's excuse me one second um cultural sectors to be more green digital inclusive resilient and competitive and as you can see there the, the green and digital it's, it is about the priorities as well of, of, of Europe is, is very important. So the program objectives um, to safeguard, develop and promote European cultural and linguistic diversity and heritage. I think that's what's, what's key as opposed to um, different from other, from other programs. Like it's very much um, uh, focused on the, the culture aspect and we know how important that is at the moment with, with what's going on to, to protect um, cultural identity of, of of European projects and of, of um, European creatives. 
And, but it also is to increase the competitiveness and the economic potential of the culture and creative sectors, and in particular, the audiovisual sector. So it aims to enhance the cooperation. It's all about collaboration. Like we've noticed, that especially with this new program of the 21, 21 to 27 um, program, that is, it's a huge amount of focus on the collaboration. So whereas before, from, from our side, you know, a, a small documentary from, from from Donegal might have been able to get to get funding um, on its own with no co-producers, that type of project is getting harder and harder. So you really need to be looking at a European um, co collaboration. So to support, support the creation of European works, strengthen the eco economic, social, and external dimension of Europe's cultural and creative sectors. Sorry, it's very, whoop, it's very text heavy. And um, to encourage cooperation on innovation, sustainability, and competitiveness and to promote cross-sectoral innovation, collaboration, co collaborative actions, as well as diverse, independent, and pluralistic media environment and media literacy. So this is actually the new, the, the program has expanded. Um, we have, there are new, um, there are new strands, which we will go into later as well, that uh, it's, 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 it's becoming a much bigger program now, especially this, um, with the, this, this current program. So in addition to that, and like Emma was saying about the, it's a really good idea. And, and it was good for you to focus on that or to highlight that because if you can get the European policies, it, it all comes back to the objectives of, of the EU and, and the programs and you know the key areas at, currently um, across all the programs and particularly for, for Crave Europe would be the inclusion, gender equality, um, and diversity and then the environment and sustainability and the fight against climate change. So they are they are key issues. And there's incentives, you know, of, of including them. I mean, literally down to you get extra points. There are five points, you know, in your application if you can show a very strong um, policy for, you know, in your company for 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 these areas. So so it's it is it's very important to be um to cover that. So I'm going now going to pass you over to Aoife who is going to bring you through um, the budget breakdown and the culture. Right. Hello, hi, thanks Orla. Um, I'm Aoife Tunney, as Orla mentioned. I work with Katie Larry in the culture office and we're based in the Arts Council. So we run the culture sub-program um, from an Irish point of view. Um, and just to look at how, as um, Orla was saying, with this new program, it is the 2021 to 2027, um, we have a, a, an upped allocation of budget to 2.44 billion across the whole program. So it is divided between our diff the different sub programs that we work on. So media gets a good chunk of it. Um, and that is generally, there's a huge amount of calls going towards the media um, and audiovisual sector. So they do need an extra bit of budget. So they get 56% um, and 36% comes to the, to the culture sub program and 13% then goes to the cross-sectoral strand. Um, you're gonna be moving the slide there. Thanks Orla. So just to look quickly at the culture strand. So for us, we support um, through the desk, the initiatives to promote and enhance artistic and cultural cooperation at a European level. Um, and there's a wide range of cultural and creative sectors that are represented. Um, as Orla said, these are the more, this funding is obviously focused on the culture sector. So it's cultural heritage, architecture, design, literature, and publishing, music, performing arts, and, and more. And just to look at the strands then that, that do bring the support to those various sectors. Um, so the main kind of one for our work would be the European cooperation projects. Um, so we'd have a lot of applications and different calls for this throughout the year. Um, but this, this kind of funding supports transnational, um, transnational projects with organizations in the culture and creative sectors and um, with projects across EU. Um, and net, European networks then, it looks at supporting networks in different sectors, so it will be um, across EU borders again, um, but more nurturing kind of talent um, and networking and generating work within the sector, sharing practices, skilling um, and upskilling and training. 
And then European platforms, um, we've had some more success stories um, under this funding strand recently. Um, and it's more looking at the promotion of emerging artists. So it is kind of a network um, of, of organizations, but it's, it's more around emerging artists um, and promoting them at a European level and um, stimulating kind of programming um, across Europe. Um, then we have iProtunus. So iProtunus has started as a pilot in 2018, but it's now a mainstay of our program. And it looks at supporting mobility for artists and cultural professionals um, and looking at collaborating across uh, Europe through um, to residencies and stuff like that. So this is one to kind of watch out for. We'll have some more calls in, in this uh, funding opportunity soon. Um, and then we're looking at the circulation of European literary works. So obviously this looks at transnational circulation of um, literature and also the trans tra translation of literary works kind of looking at including um, a diversity of languages. Then we have the pan-European cultural entities. So this is a new action um, and it supports the uh, supporting cultural entities such as uh, orchestras and stuff like that would uh, have a large uh, geographical reach um, and that, that looks at supporting kind of training and professionalization in, in that sector. Um, and the next slide. Thanks. Um, so for the last, as Orla said, we came together for the last program and that ran over 2014 to 2020. Um, and within the Culture Strand, we had 68 Irish organizations involved in Creative Europe funded projects. Um, we had a, the, there was a total project grant of 45 million and a direct grant aid to Ireland over 5 million euro, which is um, a great kind of number. Um, Ireland represents 2.26 of the overall funding across the program. Um, and Ireland's success, success rate is at 36.6%, um, and that compared to with an overall success rate of 23%. So we do quite well in our applications, and we've partnered with in 34 countries out of a possible of 41. Um, and I think I'm going to hand over to Evelyn now um, for the media. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Eva. So Jeeve, Galera Majin, hello, I'm Evelyn Iwanala from the Media Office in Galway. So I'm going to briefly go through the media strand of the Creative Europe programme, which is really support for audiovisual and video games. So uh, its main objective is to support audiovisual companies and video game studios to develop, distribute and promote European works um, in Europe and beyond. Um, but also by supporting uh, markets and high end European training programs also pro provides access for EU professionals uh, to upskill and also internationalize their projects by attending um, EU markets. So the support goes sometimes directly to European markets, but also support for umbrella stands at the main markets like Berlin and Cannes Film Festival and so on, so that there is a European presence there and that there's access for um, audiovisual professionals and video games to go to the video game uh, conferences and markets. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so this is the budget for the media strand of Creative Europe, uh, 1.427 billion. And the media strand is divided into four clusters. Uh, content, which is mostly uh, development, the development of uh, film, TV uh, projects, but also of video games, and also support for TV and online production uh, when you have multiple EU funding sources. Um, then audience focusing on festivals and uh, networks of festivals, um, business, so that's where markets, training uh, comes in, and also under DG Connect, um, uh, also promoting policy and exchange uh, and discussion through, particularly through the European film forums or fora at various uh, film festivals and events. So next slide, please. So in the last program, uh, 2014 to 2020, that image there is from a booklet uh, that we've published and is available on our website, which goes through every project, every Irish project that was funded. 
uh, in the last programme. Uh, so more than 13 million euro was awarded in direct funding to Irish film and TV companies, video game studios, distributors, training programmes, markets and festivals. And this funding has helped to grow and internationalise the Irish audiovisual sector. And as I was saying earlier, uh, Irish professionals given access to high level European training programmes and to inter international markets through the media strand. And because we work in audiovisual, the best way to give you an idea of what was supported in the last programme is to show you a video. So here it goes. Um, and so we don't have all the results from 2021 yet, but so far under the media strand, we've um, got almost 2.2 million in direct funding to uh, Irish film and television companies uh, and video game companies. Well, video games, we still don't have the results. So film and television companies so far, 2.2 million. So moving on to the cross-sectoral strand, just to explain that the cross-sectoral strand is kind of the nexus between culture and media. So it's for projects that uh, involve both audiovisual and culture. Um, and there's a number of um, schemes that support actions in this area. Uh, so first of all, the Creative Europe Desk, the network that uh, Orla mentioned earlier with, with desks in each country, that's part funded through this uh, support scheme. And then there are other uh, projects like the Creative Innovation Lab. So new innovative uh, solutions um, and projects across both audiovisual and culture. And something that's new in this program is support for news media, particularly uh, journalism partnerships uh, but also um, media freedom, which is more important than ever, particularly what, with what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. So now I'm going to hand over to Katie Larry from the Culture Office um, to take you through Creative Europe 2022. Katie, sorry, as, as you're going last, I have to give you the time warning to try and be as quick as you can. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm sure all my colleagues are laughing because I'm very <laughs> verbose, but I'll do my best. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here is so obviously there's a certain amount of these programs that is set for seven years and they won't uh, be changed. But each year work programs have to be agreed uh, with the member states. So I'm just going to talk a bit about that. And I've shared. Sorry, I went on. Mute there. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I was saying the. I'm just sharing the 2022 work program that you can see. I guess one of the silver linings uh, to the COVID cloud has been that the program has managed to secure a much larger budget than was originally anticipated. Um, so really the uh, budget for 2022 will be the highest of the program. So for Creative Europe, it's a 33% increase on 2021, which in itself was a 30% increase on the last year of the previous program. Um, you'll see through 2022, the program is still uh, looking to have a kind of direct response to COVID, recognizing how hard the cultural sectors have been hit across Europe. Um, they're continuing with a targeted sectoral approach. So kind of recognizing that some sectors have 
challenges specific to them. So you'll see in particular, um, music is one, uh, the performing arts, um, one thing that will be good and Eva mentioned is there'll be uh, 21 million to launch an artist mobility strand. So this is the only funding strand within certainly the culture program um, that is open to individual artists. Um, also just of note, and it might be mentioned in Largus's presentation, uh, but 2022 has been designated as the European Year of Youth. Um, I also wanted to mention, because I think Emma said it so well, you know, these programs don't exist in a vacuum. They exist within a kind of political economic and social reality that we're all living in. So you can see in 2022, the European Commission is um, responding directly to the war on, in Ukraine or the war on Ukraine. So just, um, I can just speak specifically, I guess, to uh, Creative Europe. So as it stands, you know, anyway, uh, Ukraine participates as a full partner within the culture program and a partial partner within media. So what we've seen on the culture side this year is uh, the commission extended uh, the deadline for cooperation projects in recognition of the situation in Ukraine. Um, part of the mobility budget uh, will be uh, reallocated directly to benefit Ukrainian artists and cultural organizations. The commission is encouraging uh, project uh, proposals to come from Ukraine in 2022. Um, I know within media, there's been a lot of um, efforts across uh, Europe to, um, to platform and showcase European films. So you, you are kind of starting to see a coordinated response there. And I know um, we've seen note within the work program or certainly within communications that there will be a special action on Ukraine this year. Um, okay, Emma, I promise it's almost done. Uh, next slide. Uh, just here is a list and we are gonna we are gonna send this through to everyone and it's all available on our website um, upcoming deadlines. So the deadlines in sorry just to say quickly I just want to give a shout out because there's probably about four times as many that are media deadlines are the blue um, culture deadlines are the, the purple and cross sectoral are orange. So this is really again just to kind of uh, quickly and Emma covered a lot of this. What I often say to people is you know this is not easy funding to achieve. And like Emma said, it's, it's not for your kind of regular ongoing work. Um, you will be looking at, uh, you know, having to demonstrate European added value to everything you do. But what we often say to people is, while it mightn't be right away, if you're kind of doing any kind of medium to long-term planning for your organization or your work, we would say, you know, consider European funding and start to look First of all, at the capacity of your organization, because a certain amount of organizational and administrative capacity is required, but also look at, you know, the work that you want to do and does it, you know, align with Creative Europe priorities. So, you know, in the case of if you, um, a lot of uh, film and media companies here anyway, collaborate across borders and, you know, kind of put together co-funding with other European partners, you know, and start to think if you're meeting or networking with your peers um, from European countries or international uh, partners, you know, start to have those conversations early about kind of longer term plans. And um, one of the things, obviously, um, a lot of the funding certainly within culture requires partnerships. So start to look at your own partnerships and your own networks first, because that's obviously the easiest thing, you know, and start to kind of develop those partnerships. Um, start to kind of think about ideas and, you know, make contact with your kind of national contact point, whatever kind of program ends up being, you know, kind of the, the right one for you and start to talk about your ideas early on to see, do you think this will be a good uh, fit? Another really kind of key thing is start to look at successful projects that are ongoing and not only look at the kind of content of them, but look at the people involved and see, are these people you'd like to develop, you know, kind of partnerships or relations relationships with but also certainly on the culture side some of these projects you know act as many funding hubs themselves so can you get involved as an individual within these projects you know be it kind of training or you know kind of networking or any of those activities we have a number you know thanks to covid of our webinars that are on our creative europe uh, desk garland youtube page and you could start to kind of watch those and really just, um, just get in touch with us as soon as possible. Um, so I think this is the last slide. So this is just, again, I think the presentations will be shared, but these are just all our channels. And I think that's us done, so thank you. Great, thank you, Katie. Well done after I put in pressure in you at the end there to, to squeeze it in, you got lots of info in there. Um, and of course, yeah, absolutely all of the slides will be circulated afterwards. 
um, with any other kind of materials that are mentioned throughout today. So um, you know, you'll receive all of that. Um, and just, it, just you can see the kind of scope of opportunities that are there. It isn't something where you just, you know, like some grant funding where you just see it and you hop onto it and hope for the best. It is something that's an investment. It's a long-term strategy for your organization, but potentially, you know, so transformative. So uh, it's well worth looking into. And I always just like the, the kind of stunning visuals and projects that you get from the creative ones. Um, so that's excellent. Thank you very much to all of the Creative Europe team there. Um, and just for other speakers, we do have a bit of buffer time, so don't worry, you're not under pressure. If you stick to your time, we, we'll, we'll work around the agenda. But at the moment now, I am handing over to Deirdre and Jane from Lergus to talk a little bit about the Erasmus Plus opportunities for creative organisations. So over to you when you're ready. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Um, good, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Deirdre Finlay and I work at Lergus and I'm just going to get Jane to say hi too. Jane is Hello. with me. So I'm the programme manager at Lergus covering Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps. And Jane, do you want to introduce your title? Sure, yeah, I'm the Inclusion and Diversity Officer at Lergus. Okay, so the way we're going to do our presentation is I'm just going to give some uh, a few words myself without slides for a few minutes and then I'm going to pass over to Jane who'll give you more content that might whet your appetite around some of the opportunities that could exist for you under Erasmus Plus and the European Solidarity Corps. Um, I'm going to ask you to use your reactions budget so I think there's 53 people on the call but it feels like it's just me. <laughs> so I want to ask you a question did you know that in Ireland via Lergus so we are the national agency for Erasmus Plus for everything outside of university uh, student placements. So we don't manage the Erasmus student placements. Did you know that there is almost 22 million euro decentralized to us to um, cascade to projects and organizations from Ireland and from around Europe? So give me a thumbs up if you knew that already. Okay, people in DCU know that, Jane knows that, Emma knows that because she's the expert. And Aileen, thanks Aileen. Okay, so I'm gonna take it that we've got quite a few newcomers, what we call newcomers on the call. And, and that's really exciting for us because one of the principal, I hate to use the word targets, but yeah, one of the things we, we are charged with doing is encouraging new people to join into the program and also to retain the existing project beneficiaries that we've had for many years. So Erasmus Plus is the program that covers education, but it's formal education and non-formal education. And its premise is around exchange and intercultural exchange. So much like what we've just been talking about through Emma's presentation and through the team from Creative Europe, our work is to foster um, partnership and for people to learn from each other from other um, member states and indeed other countries outside of the European Union. Um, so at Lergus, as I said, we're what's called a national agency. So we actually have bursary funded, decentralized to us from the European Commission. So if you apply for funding from us, um, there is some advantage in that you will get access to the team here in Lergus because we are, um, we call it the supportive approach, but we have a specific approach to work and um, much like Creative Europe, where we like to guide and support people through all stages of their application before, during and after, because undertaking a project um, that's funded by the commission can be tricky, but I don't think it's all bad. So I would just give you a flavor that Projects can range from something like 9,000 euro for a youth group to take on, undertake something that they feel is important to them, all the way up to 400,000 for maybe a two to three year project with multiple partners. So those are the brackets around which are, um, we're working in. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, the kinds of sectors that you might hear a little bit about, uh, we work heavily with the youth sector. So groups of young people, informal groups of young people. We work with schools education, the vocational education and training or what you call colleges of further education and also adult education, which is a really exciting area. Um, so I think just, I wanna comment a little bit on what you mentioned Katie about, I suppose the annual work program and the, the, the changes in the programs as we move through the cycle. So we're in 2022 now, and we know next year that our 
budget for Erasmus Plus will increase again, especially in the category of what we call mobility, which is this jargon. It just means these projects that encourage travel, travel between countries are very much politically um, encouraged. So we will see an increase in that area. Um, and also, yes, the response to crisis in Ukraine is very much to the fore in our work, and we're going to see more encouragement of, of addressing of that in projects um, this year and next year. So I think I think that's me for now. I'm going to pass over to Jane because Jane has some more kind of clear content, and um, but I'll also come back at the end to get your re reactions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dee. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. There we go. Um, yeah, so first I'll talk through a little bit around um, Erasmus Plus. Um, and here we have two key actions, we call them. So we've got key action one and key action two. Um, within key action one, we have mobility for learners and staff, uh, youth exchanges and youth participation activities. As Dee mentioned, mobility is a bit of jargon that we use, but it's, it's basically travel and encouraging travel. So mobility is for learners and staff is professional, can be professional development activities like seminars, training courses, networking and community building um, or study visits, job shadowing abroad, a wide range of things there. Um, youth exchanges is where groups of young people from two or more countries come together for non-formal activities and they're supported by a group leader. And then we have youth participation activities. And these are local, um, our transnational projects, but they're youth driven. So the young people come up with the project themselves, apply and are supported through it. Um, it's really to encourage youth participation in European democratic life and support social and civic engagement. And then under key action two, we have cooperation partnerships and small scale partnerships. So the cooperation partnerships are, are larger. They're for organizations or groups from different countries working together and um, sharing good practices or developing new ideas in their field. And then the small scale partnerships are lower grant amounts, shorter duration, um, often uh, simpler administration um, for smaller projects. And it's, it's more of a flexible format. So these can be transnational and uh, national activities um, with the European dimension. These are a bit more accessible for newcomers to the programme um, or grassroots organisations as well. Um, we also, it's, it's key to mention probably that accreditation is a new feature of the programmes. If you had experience of the programmes before, you might not be aware of this, but it is a new feature which allows an organization who is accredited to get easier access to funding in Key Action One. So it's where you submit an application for a longer term plan, and then you have easier access to the program throughout. Okay, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour of Erasmus Plus, but just to put it in context, um, an example, um, a creative example as well, is a project, a great project that was run by Cricket House Theatre. Um, it was called Inspire, and it was a training, it was to train young leaders transitioning from being led into leading in projects using theatre methods. Um, and this took the form of an 11 day training course with their partner organisation in Greece. And this is where young people developed a programme of activities that would guide them through this. And um, the project also had um, a big inclusion and diversity aspect, and some of the young people um, had fewer opportunities um, or were, were part of the LGBTQ plus um, community. Um, it's key to mention as well that there are specific inclusion supports available for people um, involved in the projects and that is for anyone who's experiencing barriers to accessing the programs. Um, these supports can be financial um, and a host of other supports as well. Um, uh, oh yeah, and the project budget, probably a key um, piece of information. So the project budget for this was uh, €29,400. Okay, and then to skip over to the European Solidarity Corps, which is a separate programme to Erasmus+. Plus. Um, there are two 
main parts of the European Solidarity Corps. There's centralized actions, which we won't talk about today, but they're um, managed by the Commission. And then we have decentralized actions, which are under Lurgis. And within that, we have the volunteering strand and solidarity projects. Um, in a similar way to accreditation to access the volunteering strand, um, we have a quality label. And to give a little bit of statistics, which um, is always nice to give some context as well. Um, last year, 12.5% of quality labels were given to cultural and creative organizations. And 56% of projects, of solidarity projects, um, were from cultural and creative organizations too, which is a very significant number. Okay, so to give some information on volunteering. Um, volunteering is a full-time activity. Um, it's up to 12 months. Um, the scope, so for an organization to accept a volunteer, you can have a volunteer for up to 12 months. The scope of volunteering projects is really broad, so it covers a wide range of areas, um, like environmental, sustainability, youth work, and social justice issues. Um, it can take place um, in Ireland or in another country. Or the volunteers that you accept can be from Ireland or from another country in Europe. Um, and volunteers are aged between 18 and 30. Um, there's also the option to have volunteer teams as well, which is sometimes um, a good option for people with fewer opportunities who would rather travel with their peers. And to give an example of a really experienced um, organization who work or who um, host European volunteers, uh, they've been hosting since 2012, is the Galway Community Circus. Um, they typically take volunteers for 11 month periods um, and they're encouraged to get involved with all aspects of the organization. Um, the Galway Community Circus work with schools and youth and community groups to help disadvantaged and at risk vulnerable people develop self-confidence and social skills. They're also part of an international network called Caravan. So this, um, they're, they're, and they're adapting um, a part of their current project to support uh, young people coming from Ukraine. And to move to solidarity projects, these are a little bit similar to youth participation projects under Erasmus Plus. So they're youth-led projects, they're shorter duration, so they can be 12 to 12, or two to 12 months long. Um, they happen in country and they're for groups of five or more young people. And a really, a really great project um, example for this is the Cabin Studio in Cork with their project It's Okay Cork, where a group of young people saw the negative impact the pandemic had. Um, and how it contributed, the isolation contributed to mental ill health. And they used art to develop um, activities connected to, to connect people, sorry, and raise awareness around mental health. Um, they ran a series of workshops, um, which included art therapy, visual art, dance, music, poetry, and photography. A real, yeah, loads and loads of activities there. Um, and they also have a network of young people in direct provision centres and um, people with disabilities and people from marginalised communities. This project ran for 12 months and it was a much smaller grant. Um, it was for €8,892. Euro. Just a quick time warning there, Jane. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm nearly there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just to give you, um, just to let you know what's coming up. Uh, in the next while for Lurgis, we've got a, a couple of different workshops and training that might be of interest. One is the Doorstep Mile, which is supporting young people in the great outdoors well-being around youth work. We also have theatre-based techniques for change, which is supporting young or supporting youth workers to use drama facilitation as a way to support young people uh, and art as a means of political activism as well. Um, there are dates to be confirmed. Um, also, as Katie mentioned, uh, this is the European Year of Youth, and we have um, micro grants available. We have six different deadlines this year, so check out our website, and there's small grant amounts available there to activities connected to the European Year of Youth. 
Um, yeah, just to wrap up then there's, so you're aware of this, um, specific deadlines for applications throughout the year. Um, and that we run a host of workshops to help you through that. Like Deirdre said, we're highly supportive. So we'll help you from thinking of your idea to finding partners to doing your application right through to final report stage. Okay, I better stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Jane. I'll pass back to Dee. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, I, I love the examples. Those are the examples that Jane picked out for this morning, but there are so many others in terms of projects that involve um, the arts, because I suppose, um, you know, we have um, sp specific priorities in the program around inclusion, sustainability, etc. And in many cases, creative organizations are touching into those subjects naturally anyway. So there's a really good synergy. And um, some of the events that you put up there, Jane, they are actually what we call our TCA program of work, where you would actually meet people from other member states at those trainings. You may at some of them anyway. So they are a particular approach to you meeting with people um, from all around Europe. And there you may find partners. So we don't do partnership development events as such. We like to bring people together in a thematic way and something that we think might be interesting or exciting. And from there, you may get the kernel of a project that we'd be more than happy to help foster in future. So keep an eye, I think, on the website for those kinds of opportunities and events, and we will be sure to cascade them to, learn, um, to the wheel as well. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Great. That's, that's Thank brilliant. Thank you so much, Dee and Jane. Um, and yeah, it's just what uh, Erasmus, it's one of those ones where people don't realize just how many opportunities are under it um, for sectors beyond education and it's one of the really nice kind of because it's got so many different levels from those kind of small grants to the mobility projects to even large-scale partnerships it's a really nice kind of entryway into EU funding in a lot of ways and a really good way to kind of build networks you can start off with kind of lower stakes projects where if it's your first time you're not under as much pressure and then and then kind of scale up from there so it's a really kind of wholly recommend it as somebody who's both managed the projects and supported people through applications it's a really good one to get started and we're very lucky to have such not every member state has such a engaged and supported national agency so we're very lucky to have that in Ireland and um, but that's great thank you so much to our first two kind of speakers we have the Creative Europe team and the Lergus team to talk about Erasmus Plus and the Solidarity Corps and um, we're going to take a bit of a break now for about 10 minutes and we'll come back then, uh, we'll be looking at the Marius Kowalski Flory actions and the cluster two of Horizon Europe um, projects and funding opportunities under that. But I think we can probably go to, we, we'll give you until 10 past 12, we'll be generous and give you an extra minute. Um, and uh, so we see you then, so make sure you get up, have a little bit of a move around, uh, don't look at the screen and we'll see you at 10 past. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, so we're bang on 10 past now. Um, so we will continue on with our agenda for today. And now we are going to ha hand over to Dr. Jane Carrigan and Dr. Yvonne Halpin from the Irish Universities Association to talk about the Mary Skodetska Curie actions and opportunities for that with creative organizations. So over to you, Yvonne or uh, Jane, I, can't, I don't know who's going first. It's me. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Emma. Um, so Jane will, will move the slides along uh, for me. I'm not going to speak for very long. Good afternoon, um, everyone. So I'm Yvonne Halpin and I'm the head of the Irish Marie Skrowska Curie Office, um, or the IMSCO, as we refer to it in short. Um, and I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, so Jane Carrigan and Kiara Loda, who will present to you on the MSCA and on Horizon Europe uh, Cluster 2. Um, so Jane, I might get you to move along to the next slide if that's working, super. Um, so the IMSCO were supported by the Irish Research Council, um, but very much operated under um, a joint partnership with the Irish Universities Association. And the missions of our office are to support uh, the research community in promoting um, or supporting the community by promoting um, the programmes which we represent, the European Union funding programmes which we represent, and that's the MSCA, um, the European Research Council from the Social Sciences and Humanities um, Perspective and Cluster 2 programmes. And it's important to note that we aim to support 
the entire research and innovation community in Ireland. So that's the academic sector and the non-academic sector. And we also work across all disciplines as well. So we aim to support our application, our, our um, applicants and our community by provision of information. We run webinars, events. We help applicants with uh, proposal kind of conception and, and um, proposal review and that kind of thing um, in the lead up to call deadlines. And, and we have a number of um, resources and, and guidance documents, that kind of thing was very useful. Um, and then Jane, just to pop to the next slide briefly, because I don't want to take too much of, uh, of Jane's time. But um, so just to say, we work with these programmes which are part of Horizon Europe, and that's the, the EU's key funding programme for research and innovation. And it has a budget of about 95.5 billion over seven years, which I know has been said already a lot this morning, seems like a lot, but when you spread that over all of the calls, et cetera, um, it can spread quite thin. Anyway, put that aside. So we're going to talk to you today about the MSCA and about uh, Cluster 2 as well. And so, as I said, you know, Horizon Europe, it's not just for academic organisations. It's very much open to non-academic organisations such as yourself, and you're very much eligible to apply to relevant funding calls, which, which suit your own research and innovation um, objectives. So briefly, just to note, um, the Marie Skodowska Curie actions, they sit in pillar one. Um, and to highlight that that's a bottom up programme. And what we mean by that is that the applicants themselves choose their own kind of research and innovation topic and their own research and innovation project. So all disciplines are eligible to, to apply. Cluster 2, that's a bit different. And Chiara will speak to that um, in her presentation. But for now, Jane's going to talk to you uh, a little bit more about the different um, actions within the MSCA and how organisations such as yourselves can participate in those actions. So I'll hand over to Jane. Great. Thanks, Yvonne. So I thought I'd start by really answering the question, what are the Mary Skodowska Curry Actions, or MSCA for, for short? Um, they're named after the inspiration uh, uh, scientist and Nobel winning scientist Marie Curie, and they're an EU research funding program, but they're a key source of research funding for um, researchers in Ireland across all disciplines. And they're the European Union's flagship uh, program for doctoral education and postdoctoral training. So they support researchers uh, from all over the world with a focus on training skills and career development. And lots of different types of organizations can apply, as, as Yvonne said, and they include non-academic organizations uh, such as charities, cultural uh, organizations, who can all host and train researchers at, at no cost. Now, under uh, H2020, uh, Ireland has been really successful in securing MSCA funding with over 197 million uh, euro awarded. So uh, that's over 500 projects and, and more than 1,400 um, researchers. So we've had tremendous success uh, in the past, but I, I thought I'd, I'd go through now what are the key features of the MSCA. And the motto of the MSCA is developing talents and advancing researchers, advancing research. So that gives you an indication. So a key factor in any MSCA is to support the mobility, training and career development of researchers. And the MSCA does this through a number of means, uh, including postdoctoral fellowships, doctorates and also collaborative projects. Uh, another important feature is that it supports excellent research in all domains and all disciplines. And it has, as Yvonne mentioned, there a bottom up approach. So researchers decide the focus of the research problem that they want to address. It's not predefined. It's also about what can be called the three eyes, so international, intersectoral, and interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity um, cooperation. And MSCA is really about stimulating such cooperation. MSCA also prides itself on promoting attractive working and employment conditions. And that's reflected on the importance it places on European principles, uh, such as those contained in the Code of Conduct for the Recruitment of Researchers and the European Charter for Researchers. And it sees itself as having an impact, not just on in the individual career of researchers, but also on the organizations that are, that are participating. And um, participation from non-academic sector is strongly uh, encouraged. So who can apply? Well, the academic uh, sector can uh, and does apply, but the non-academic sector can apply too. And non-academic uh, eligible legal entities could be civic society organizations, could be hospitals, could be galleries, could be art organizations. So what can the MSCA offer you 
uh, and what, what are the benefits that, that it brings? Well, it's really an effective way of receiving funding for a, a research project that aligns with your research needs. And the bottom up approach that Yvonne mentioned is really attractive in, in that regard. So it's a way of doing cutting edge research in a very cost effective way that will strengthen your research and innovation capacity. It's also a terrific way of accessing excellent researchers. And it may also give you access to state of the art technologies and infrastructures through the network that you otherwise wouldn't have had. Uh, and plus it will help of course, to grow your organization's visibility and, and reach. And in terms of the benefits it offers to researchers, well, I've mentioned that mobility training and career development are, are key features of the MSCA. So you can see the benefits that it will offer researchers in terms of gaining new knowledge and transferable skills and gaining new experiences. Uh, and that includes international experiences, intersectoral experiences, interdisciplinary ones. It also gives researchers access to networks and organizations and, and access to people. And in doing so, they're getting, I suppose, access to different ways of thinking and different ways of doing things. And all of this, of course, will help their career and employment uh, prospects. So there's huge benefits to the researchers involved. Um, in terms of the type of funding under MSCA, there are five types of MSCA uh, and they all target different objectives. But I thought for this presentation, I'm just going to concentrate on the four that really fund research uh, and projects. So we have postdoctoral fellowships, doctoral networks, staff exchange, and then uh, co-fund. And uh, I suppose each of those projects would have a lot of detail with the, within them what they what they do. But I thought a really useful way to think about this is to think about what you need as an organisation, uh, and that's that can be a useful way of deciding which one of these actions may be best, um, maybe a, a better fit for, for your uh, for your needs. So are you looking for a highly qualified postdoctoral uh, researcher to work with you? And if you are, you might think of the postdoctoral fellowship action, and that's when a pre-identified researcher applies with a host organization, and then together you work on the application. Now, there are eligibility criteria to all of these actions, uh, and one of them for the postdoctoral fellowship includes mobility um, uh, rule. So, for example, in the European postdoctoral fellowship, the researcher couldn't have worked or studied in Ireland for more than a year in, in the previous three years before the call deadline. Um, but it's a great way of getting access to um, um, an excellent postdoctoral researcher. You also might be interested in the co-fund action and to get involved in, a, in that as a partner. So an MSCA co-fund is where the EU co-finances a, a doctoral or postdoctoral program, and that leverages new or existing uh, funding. So in a, in a sense, the applicant becomes the funder. And in practical terms, uh, applicants to co-fund tend uh, to be existing funders in Ireland, such as the Irish Research Council, or organisations that have an ability to leverage existing funds, such as SFI centres. So it might not be uh, feasible at all that your organisation becomes a co-fund applicant, or even desirable they become a co-fund applicant, but it could be an option to become an implementing or associate partner, and we'll talk uh, more about that uh, a little bit later. Um, perhaps it's not a postdoctoral um, uh, researcher that your organisation is looking for, but maybe uh, you want to become part of a, an, an international consortium um, and collaborate with others. So other types of MSCA funding that you could look at in this regard are staff exchange um, and then doctoral networks. So a staff exchange could be useful if you want to broaden the horizon of your staff and build a research network or consolidate one. It involves organizations from the academic and non-academic sector to coming together to write a proposal with an overarching research objective. And the research projects are then implemented through these staff exchanges or secondments. So there's lots of mobility involved in the staff exchange and it funds short term international and inter um, intersectoral secondments um, of staff who are already involved in research activities and the secondments are between one and 12 months. Um, a doctoral network could also be uh, of interest if you as an organization want to get involved in a doctoral program 
or are, are interested in training a new generation, if you like, of PhD candidates from abroad. So it will involve recruiting a PhD um, uh, candidate, but it also involves training and research um, activities between participating organisations uh, and secondments. And this is where you can decide how you'd like to participate, because there are different ways in which an organisation can participate in an MSCA project, depending on your organisation's capacity. So how to participate? Well, an associate partner can participate in a network without recruiting a researcher. So through provision of training or hosting a secondment where you co-supervise a doctoral student. And a more involved uh, partner, if you like, would be a beneficiary. And they receive funding directly to recruit, host and supervise a, a researcher. Uh, and I suppose the most involved is a coordinator or lead beneficiary who coordinates the proposal preparation and the successful implementation of, of the network. So again, a lot of uh, decisions you make, how you become involved will depend on the capacity and the needs of your organisation. But I thought I'd give you a few um, examples uh, and just a flavour really of how different organisations in, in the cultural sector have become involved and really just to plant some seeds of possibility uh, for you. So an example I have here is a postdoctoral researcher who came to the Irish Traditional uh, Music Archive to work on a project called Linked Irish Traditional Music. So uh, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the researcher would have applied with Irish Traditional Music Archive um, and was hosted there for the two years of the, of the fellowship. I've included the link in the slide to Cordis, which is really useful website for, for learning more about this particular project, but also useful for seeing other projects that have been um, uh, funded. Um, it may not be an option for your organization to want to supervise um, a postdoctoral fellowship or, or, or be the, app, the um, host organization for the postdoctoral fellowship. So I've included in this slide other options where you could become involved. So you could collaborate with an applicant organization. So that could be a university or an institute of technology. And they're going to host the researcher, but you, your organization might become involved in terms of offering a period of secondment for the research, uh, for the researcher. So, um, and that would involve them um, uh, uh, working and, and training. You would offer training to the researcher, but you could also become involved as a, a host for the non-academic placement. And that's this really uh, relatively new addition to the postdoctoral fellowship and um, a great addition. So you can see the benefits that could. Um, uh, give to both an organization and the researchers. So there's a couple of different options uh, for the postdoctoral fellowship. Another example was um, uh, staff exchange. So as the name suggests, the staff exchange is about the convent of, of staff and the mobility of, of staff. And the SpaceX project was um, addressing the, the use of, pop um, addressing really the rise of, of populist nationalism um, in, in Europe and, and conflict in European societies. And was looking at ways in which uh, we're looking to find new ways in which people could um, uh, live together in a more inclusive way. So it was trying to link together, make connections between spatial practices and cultural sociology, cultural policy, and also behavioural economics. So you can see the, the intersectoral scope this would have. And it was um, a, quite a large international um, consortium that received funding um, uh, I think it was made up of uh, 27 partners across nine EU member states, made up of universities and acad academies and um, uh, lots of cultural organisations. So including the Project Arts Centre here, and you can see the three Irish partners who were involved in this uh, international consortium, Project Arts Centre, NCAD uh, and um, UCD. And there's a Cordis link there if you, if you want to find out uh, some more. Um, I'll just mention a couple of MSCA deadlines and uh, that are, are coming uh, up. The call for the uh, MSCA postdoctoral fellowship on the doctoral network is opening soon on the 12th of May and they've deadlines September and November respectively. Um, and uh, um, there's other deadlines as well uh, coming up in um, uh, for co-fund and staff exchange too in 2023. Just to say uh, the MSCA calls runs every year so if this year it's not uh, feasible for you to apply it could be something you think in future years as well.
we've lots of links here to I suppose uh, to get started with the MSCA, including the first one, which is the link to our own um, uh, website in the uh, IUA um, webpage. Um, the third link down is the work program. So this is really, I, I go into the work program, if you've really decided you want to find out in much more detail what's involved, it was quite a, a large document. But these links offer a good place to, I suppose, to start uh, thinking about MSCA. Uh, and finally, just to say, if, if the presentation has, has sparked an idea or you have something in mind, but you'd like to tease it out further or um, uh, figure out if it really is a good fit, myself and Yvonne are, are more than open to, to meeting with you uh, and to teasing it out uh, together. And we'd very much welcome you to get to get in touch with us. You can contact us via our own direct email. So it's yvonne.halpin at iua.ie or jane.carrigan at iua.ie. But we can also be reached through the Marie Curry uh, email address. So it's just on that slide there, Marie Curry at iua.ie. We also have a Twitter um, account. So please follow us on that and, and we'll keep you uh, updated. Um, and just to say, we run webinars throughout the year on our calls. We have a webinar coming up on our doctoral network call ne uh, next Thursday. So we'll put the, I'll put the link in the chat there if people are interested in that. Thanks very much uh, for listening. And please do contact us if we can be of uh, further help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. That was an excellent overview. Um, and I think it's one of those things where we might not necessarily think of research funding as being applicable, but it's we all need research to inform our practices and measure impact and influence policy and make a case for further funding. And all of that stuff is really, really important. So certainly if you uh, see an opportunity there that you could use research to, to enhance your work, then it's definitely worth reaching out. It's very rare that you get funding opportunities to fund a staff member. I mean, that's that's extremely rare. So um, uh, yeah, thank you so much to, to Yvonne and Jane there. And we're going to move on to their colleague now, Chiara Loda, from, uh, also from the IUA, to talk a little bit about a different branch of research funding. So over to you, Chiara, when you're ready. Yep, I'll try to share my screen. Okay, give me one sec. Okay, so. Here we are, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me and for organizing the event. Um, and uh, I won't spend uh, that much time uh, to introduce myself uh, since uh, Ivana already kindly did it. Just want to say that uh, as an NCP, I promote cluster two, like uh, what I'm doing today, and uh, I do it uh, with uh, like with um, participants and potential applicants from all sectors. And uh, I offer uh, like uh, flexible ongoing support uh, during the writing uh, of the proposal, similarly to Erasmus Plus and Creative Europe. It is mostly service per coordinator, but uh, I can be flexible about that, especially if the applicants are from the non-academic sector. And so this presentation, it is of course introducing what is a cluster two. I will do it uh, rel relatively quickly just giving you the main details. There is no point in killing anyone by PowerPoint. And then I will try to answer the question, why cluster two matters to the creative and cultural sectors? And I try to answer this question by saying why some non-academic organizations focus on this field should be involved uh, in a research, like in a research consortia. Why should the research activities be a focus? We will talk um, about some uh, examples of Irish successful engagement, and we will look um, at, the perf at the performances. Also, thinking how, like, uh, how we can even improve from there, and also we will uh, just uh, fi finish up uh, with some tips and tricks. So. I have uh, the Horizon Europe slide again. It is a bit uh, less pretty than the one uh, that the Marie Curie team had, but still pillar two, as uh, Yvonne introduced, is uh, about uh, like a top down, like a like a top down research. So cluster two, that is about democracy, cultural heritage, and, and social and economic transformations, is not about funding them research, the ideas of researchers. People cannot come up with their own ideas. It is about responding to the challenges that are 
outlined by the Commission and all projects are expected to be a direct answer to that. We will come back, we will come back to that. Cluster 2 also is not about individual researchers, it is always about consortia. Three participants is the minimum in terms of eligibility, but usually it is bigger than that. And projects are generally in the funding region of two, three, sometimes four million euros. It is uh, intersectoral, so academic partner, uh, academic and non-academic partners are not only welcome, but uh, inclusion of uh, an intersectoral element makes the proposal way more competitive, and we're coming back to that. The next line is uh, in 2023, and we don't have uh, the exact dates yet. Anyway, like uh, we want to uh, just uh, wait for that, uh, because uh, some drafts uh, are already being circulated. So for those are inter who are interested, there are opportunities to see how things uh, are developing, uh, are developing like in these months. So I will just break down for you like cluster two, because I'm, like it can be quite big. So there are three main thematic areas that if we use the European Commission jargon, they're called destinations. One is called democracy, the other one is called European cultural heritage and the cultural and creative, creative industries, and the third one is transformation. I made, I made the heritage destination bigger just because it's probably the most relevant to this audience, not because there is a, a, like a, any advantage to that or is more important, it was just to keep it relevant to you. And there's... Um, destinations they're further subdivided in annual call there was one in 2022 that the deadline just passed in april but as we said more things are coming up and then if we kind of go down there are some little stars with a team these are the topics and topics are the things that applicants must focus on since they are the problems that the commission wants us to focus on and provide solutions. Here I have examples of topics that still come from the 2022 deadline that passed, but I believe that absurd examples don't work well, at least I don't get them, so I prefer to keep things a bit more tangible. So if you read the title of the destination, like innovative research, like uh, on the European cultural heritage and the cultural and creative industries, it just brought, I mean, everything could fit under that. It is an empty box. And we know that the deadline was 2022, but even that is not informative. The moment that we start getting some information about what we are expected to do is when we read uh, the topic title. And uh, I have uh, highlighted in, I believe it is light orange, something like that, whitish orange, like the topics that could be relevant to this audience, like Europe's cultural heritage and arts promotion, our values at home and abroad. Like the results, if we look at the bottom games and cultures shaping our society, um, like I wanted to mention it since there is some overlapping with creative Europe. Of course, they are all research calls, but what I wanted to say is that they're probably relevant to many people in this, in this audience. And at the same time, not everything is relevant to everyone. So the first step is familiarizing ourselves to, with what is included in the work program thematically. Now, I mean, I'm just leaving, like kind of dropping any other comments about the nitty, -nitty, the nitty gritty of cluster two. If you want to hear more, like I can follow up individually. But uh, I thought that I wanted to use my time to explain why, like uh, this, like a uh, cluster two, that you know it is a, a research, a res you know, a research program within Horizon Europe that is the flagship research innovation action is uh, relevant to cultural and the creative sector, especially like non-academic ones. So why not to just look at uh, other programs? that they seem kind of more tailor-made. So to find an answer, I think that we can start just looking at the policy documents. The main policy document is the work program. And if we, if we read it, we can see that it's spelled out very 
clearly that there is open reference to the importance of involving the sector, the increasing of non-academic partners, including from the cultural industries, is an open target that the Commission is keen on. And also like cluster two is extremely focused on social societal gains like job creation, and that cannot be achieved without the involvement of all sectors, including like non-academic partners, practitioners, and civic, civic and cultural organizations. And uh, this point about the importance of including like the creative and cultural sector is not just something that is written in a policy program and buried there, but is something that we can clearly see implemented in evaluation practices. So these comments are from evaluators, they have been made in the context of the evaluations of proposals submitted for the Heritage Call 2021. They were redacted for confidentiality, but everything that you can see is true. And you can see that in many cases, evaluators pointed out as a strength the inclusion of the cultural and creative sector. Like at some point, in one case, they even said that fostering a mutually beneficial relationship between cultural heritage and the local community is an exemplary aspect of this proposal. This is a proposal that scored extremely high. And in other cases, the lack of inclusion of these sectors has been pointed out as a weakness. So like I'm kind of making this point, not only talking to you know, representatives of the cultural and creative sectors like non-academic, you know, working in organizations, but this is a point that can be made also to academic coordinators working together makes your proposal makes your proposal stronger. Here I have a real time, a real life example of a project involving Irish partners and that was funded under Horizon 2020, that was the predecessor of Horizon Europe. And the goal of this project is to fund a competence center for the conservation of cultural heritage. You can see here that Career, that is an Irish organization focused on archeology span and architecture was involved. First of all, I wanted to show you this slide to kind of point out like the quality and quantity of partners. You can see first the, like the number and also the geographical spread, not only in the European Euro Union and beyond. So just to give you a sense of the opportunities coming with being involved in this kind of project. But also wanted to show it because many times people, they hear about these presentations that in theory are very nice, but in practice is a bit challenging to relate to what you can do, what could be your, your space in a project like that. So if you're interested, my suggestion is just do some Googling. You can Google this project, that's a starting point. If you want to see more, I can point you to more projects like that. I think that, you know, starting to see what the others did is the best way to find your own space in that. Also, like I, I promised you that I would have talked about Irish performances and the like these stats is about the involvement of the non NGOs and the creative industries in the 2021 calls. I'm just looking at the heritage destination. And if we look at Ireland, we can see that there were like nine proposals that included an Irish partner from that sector that were submitted. One was successful. And the partner, like the success, this successful partner was uh, awarded three and like uh, 300,500 euros. So it's quite uh, um, con like a, a consider uh, considerable, a considerable amount. If we compare the engagement of, you know, of uh, this sector uh, to the engagement in the other destinations, like uh, democracy and transformations, we see that uh, heritage is by far the most popular. In other words, uh, you know, like uh, charities and organizations uh, 
active in the creative and cultural sectors are already forerunners in their engagement with, with research programs like that. So it, there are really good things. I kind of compared these numbers with, uh, like with other countries in the European Union, and I believe that there is a scope for even, for even further engagement and further success. And in this regard, I believe that is extremely fortunate that Access Europe is there since it can provide tailor-made sub tailor support to applicants that would like to start, but of course that they need um, a, like a, an extra push. And uh, this slide, and then coming to work, like towards the end, is um, about future opportunities. Like at the beginning of the presentation, I said that there was a call and that the deadline just passed in like in, in April, but that new calls like will like will be published. And there's a project of defining the topics and deciding you know like a, what like what people will be asked to submit projects about is not a secretive project a process that happened in Brussels behind closed doors. It is something that the program committee leads on, but a plurality of stakeholders are included. And of course, the stakeholders are based also in Ireland. So some early drafts have already been circulated. And we know that probably, I say probably because nothing is a final, it is still very much work in, work in, in, like a work in process, like the following topics, will come up possibly, and it is preservation of heritage monuments, culture and green technologies, digitalization of heritage, languages and heritage, and cultural heritage and rural areas. My thing is like, of course, this is just an indication, but if you are interested or potentially interested in submitting, just try to get the work program. I think the will has it, like, of course, you can always talk to me, but don't wait for December for the publication of the work program to start partnering like a good coordinators with good consortia. They start working behind the scene before that and being proactive in this regard will enhance your opportunities to be included in a good, cons in a good consortium. I'm finishing now and I have some tips and tricks. The first one, and I should have written it in capital letters, it is six support. I mean, the will can help you, like I can help you if you need it. And this help can take many forms. It can be, you know, like the review, like some support in writing the proposal or understanding what is the topic that is the best fit for you, but also it can be help in terms of finding partners that seems a barrier in many cases. Again, Access Europe can, like, can make the difference. Start early and that links up with my previous slide. Don't to start don't start activating two months before the deadline. I mean, you can be extremely lucky and find someone that has a gap in expertise, but I would call it a stroke of luck. In most cases, like a good coordinators tend to have their people lined up pretty soon. So the sooner you start contacting them, better are your chances. And the other thing that probably links to the previous points is like understand where you fit. We saw that Class, like a cluster two is quite big, even if we narrowed that down to the heritage destination is quite big. It also includes things that are more about the humanities. So kind of selecting early two, three possible topics that could be of interest is a good way to focus energies instead of dispersing them. So um, I'm just a these links. I thought that I was thanking you, but uh, I'm not. So like one is the Curtis database. Like uh, as I said before, it is always a good idea to see what the others did to be successful. And uh, on Curtis database, uh, you can see like many, pro like, you know, all the projects funded under Horizon 2020. You can use filters uh, if you want to see only projects involving Irish partners uh, or only projects uh, 
about uh, you know so fatal challenge six that is the predecessor of cluster two but you know it's a good idea to see the composition of the consortium or the extras of successful projects and of course uh, all projects have websites so you can do a lot, a lot of digging and the other tool that I want to mention is Campus Engage, like Christine and myself, we're taking together a course about engaged engage research. Like Campus Engage has a huge experience in working with non-academic partners and integrating them effectively in research projects. They have some toolkits that are in plain English, they're extremely well done. So for those of you who would like to, you know, start uh, finding uh, opportunities within research, research programs, I would recommend you to consult it. Okay, I'm finishing. I'm finishing now. And uh, I just want to thank you. We recently launched uh, a Twitter account that uh, is about uh, funding opportunities uh, under Horizon Europe also for the nonprofit sector and the humanities, and these are my contact information. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kira. That was excellent. Um, uh, lots of information there. And I'm glad that you mentioned the engaged research thing at the end there. Um, so for those of you who don't know, engaged research is where various stakeholders, um, particularly civil society and the academic sector working together. Because for a lot of, I think for a lot of organizations, uh, being an applicant might be a little bit of a kind of lofty ambition or certainly a big challenge because these are very uh, challenging applications. Um, but certainly be partnering with an academic institute uh, would be, you know, and an, an availing of their kind of expertise when it comes to applying for research funding um, is, is very possible. It's a very good way to kind of get your foot in the door of that horizon research funding. Um, and certainly if you're, if you're working in a certain creative area um, maybe you're working in theatre and youth or uh, disability and art, whatever it is, if there are people, if there are researchers in Ireland who are looking at that from an academic perspective, it's, it's kind of that whole point of making it your business to know who they are and forming relationships, starting conversations so that when the right opportunities come up, whether it's a Creative Europe project or whether it's a, a Horizon Europe project or a Marie Curie project, whatever it is that, you know, there's there's already relationships in place that will pave the way for opportunities. So I think a lot of it, a lot of EU funding in general comes down to networking again and again. It kind of comes back to those partnerships and those collaborations, regardless of what program you're looking at. Um, so, and so and a, a, a typical kind of trajectory for EU funding might be to start small with a kind of network building project and then scale up to a, a more ambitious project. And then, you know, you might be looking at, you know, starting off with something small, but maybe five years, seven years, eight years down the line, you're looking at potentially being partners in a big horizon project. So I suppose for all of this information, just recognize that there are entryways and pathways in that allow you to gradually build your capacity. And um, just to know that that is our final uh, input of today. So if you do have any questions, this is your chance to, to ask. There was one question that was sent directly about, I suppose, um, the reporting requirements for programs like these. And, you know, would you need dedicated staff? And, you know, that they'd heard that it can be quite onerous. And I suppose that can be true. What I said, I suppose, is that uh, it depends on the scale of the program. If you're going for a very small sale grant, it may be one of those uh, micro grants from Lergus uh, as a starting point or a small kind of mobility project as a starting point. Generally, the reporting is quite manageable. I've done it for various projects. It's it's very manageable. Um, it can be a bit hard to get your head around if you're not used to it, but that's part of the learning curve. And then once you do it once, it becomes a lot easier. But certainly as the money goes up, the reporting burden does tend to go up. So I don't know if any of our speakers, uh, I don't know from the Creative Europe side of things, maybe Katie or, or one of the team there, um, in terms of reporting burden, I suppose, what can be expected? Um, I think it's probably a big part of it um, is really kind of setting up a, a good system for kind of monitoring and kind of all of that. I mean, one of the things would be when you're assessing your own organizational capacity, looking at, I guess, the skill set of staff, because what a lot of these projects do is they kind of tend to apportion existing staff's time, you know, to projects. I mean, some would um, hire, you know, a project manager for that, but a lot of times it might be kind of allocating a certain amount of time and responsibility to someone in in-house. 
I know um, not to get into too much detail, but within Creative Europe, um, it's really changed from a, you know, kind of financial audit based reporting to um, something that's more structured around deliverables. So I don't know if anyone else wants to kind of come in on this, but it's really about, I think, you know, setting up systems as you go along. And I think um, I do think it is manageable, but it certainly is it is work and you will have to kind of scope it within your existing resources and allocate either allocate existing resources or look at kind of bringing someone in. Um, but it would, um, I certainly think it would be achievable. What do you, Aoife or Evelyn or Orla want yeah. to come in? Um, there has been a change in the new program. Um, all the calls now are related to lump sums system rather than uh, in the previous program where you had to do financial reporting. Uh, so the advantage is that you don't have to do financial reporting now or get an auditor's report. Um, but so the the payment of the final tranche of funding is related to outputs and deliverables. And there's a continuous reporting system now on an online uh, portal where so you upload deliverables at particular due dates along the lifetime of the project. So it's more setting up um, the correct system and making sure that your deliverables are deliverable <laughs> so that you, you know, you don't say that you're going to deliver something that then proves tricky or that time moves on and you're not able to deliver it by the due date. But again, we're here to help you with all of that. Uh, if you are selected and you get to the uh, grant agreement stage, we can help you through that and give you advice on what kind of deliverables to put in so our our new line in the new program is when you're writing up these work packages that you have to have for the new reporting system is that you are specific with the tasks but vague with the deliverables so that you don't tie yourself into something that uh, will cause you problems down the line but that's what we're here for we can help you through it yeah excellent yeah and and the, i'm a big fan of the lump sum approach uh, erasmus did a similar thing um, and it's so, so much more focused on impact and less about the admin that, that kind of goes into it and um, it's so much more streamlined so I don't know if uh, Jane or Claire if you have any notes I have one more question here that's after popping up but did you have anything that you wanted to say about the kind of reporting side of things? Jane, if you want to go first, I, I, I gave two people yeah. there. Sorry. <laughs> no, um, I, suppose, I suppose what myself and Yvonne have found is that uh, organisations who've been through it before tend to build up experience, um, and that uh, reflects really what you were saying uh, as well. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem to be, we're, we're told, um, it doesn't seem to be as onerous as perhaps other projects, but everything, I suppose, is hard the first time you do it. Um, and we can certainly help um, uh, along the way. I would think um, a, a good piece of advice as well, if you're getting into consortium led projects is to work out, even if the proposal doesn't demand that you, you organize who's getting what, that you have those discussions early on with the beneficiary. I think they make life an awful lot easier in, in the long run. And um, so as, as Katie was kind of alluding to there, I suppose have a think about how this is going to uh, uh, work out in practice if funding is, is awarded. Yeah, yeah and just to, just to add, Emma, as, as Jane was saying, it, it depends, I think, on what way you choose to participate, like your, your reporting commitments and the kind of admin commitments would be less, for example, if you're an associated partner in a collaborative project versus if you're the lead beneficiary or something like that but as Jane was saying if you yeah. if you become a partner in a network and that network gets funded for a project all of your requirements are laid out in a consortium agreement at the at the start of that before anything is started so that's your opportunity to really lay out and, and to plan for you know what kind yeah. of commitment and time you need to give to it yeah and it, it kind of I suppose vouchers for that gradual ease yourself in don't yeah. don't throw yourself in at the deep end yeah. if you can avoid it uh, Kiara, we have one more question, so I'll ask you quickly if you have anything that you want to know about reporting, because I, I do want to get to that final question. I'd say that I just said um, everything, the only thing, yes. is just talk to the coordinator, keep your timesheet or whatever is um, like a, is a required, uh, keep, like a keep it uh, in order, just upload uh, things uh, as, uh, as you go instead of doing uh, everything uh, at the end. Yeah. Absolutely. And just to say that if you were taking on a project for the first time, 
uh, Access Europe, we're here to help people get funding, but we're also there for the lifetime of the project to help to make sure that you have a positive experience with it. So we can work with you to help you set up systems to make sense of what is required from you by whatever program is funding you and set up systems early, because I think where people do run into that problem is where they didn't fully understand it. And then they get to the interim phase and there's kind of this panic of trying to go back and and trace things that have already happened and things like that so you, you won't be on your own with that and absolutely um uh you know we can help you with that so don't try not to let that be too much of a deterrent uh, that kind of anxiety about the reporting thing um there was one question about european partnership and is it required in all programs so i think it's fair to say all of the horizon both marie curie and uh, cluster two require EU partnership and I think all of Creative Europe and maybe there's one or, or two I think certainly under the Solidarity Corps that don't require your if, if I'm wrong people uh, uh, tell me but Dean or, or, or yeah. Jane can you maybe say about those kind of national opportunities that, that yeah. we have? There are two national opportunities I think that I can speak to quickly that would be of interest so one is under Erasmus Plus huge program, but a small action specifically for youth. But I have to stress it's youth led. So it must come from the young people themselves, which is called a participation project. And it's brilliant. So for example, a group of young people got together in Ballyfermot and they wanted to refurbish the skate park. So they, that project was funded by Erasmus Plus because it was actually about participation, participating with local councillors um, in, in, I suppose, in processes and democratic processes and the young people leading that it's about 9,000 euro, I think. Second one is under the European Solidarity Corps, which is a separate program that we manage. That's called the Solidarity Projects. It's the same thing. It's, it's, um, it's a group of young people coming together, but to volunteer together on something that they wish to do themselves. It would lend itself well to the arts and um, it's a small amount of money and it's national without partners. If that's any good, we're here to discuss those options with people. Great, thank you so much for that, Dee. Am I right that everybody else, you all report there, it's European partnership is universal. Sorry, Jane, go ahead. Uh, me, is it me? Oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, I was looking at the purple background. Sorry, yeah. Ron, go ahead. Uh, I guess to, to highlight um, for, you know, for most of the, the Maurice Kodoska Curie Actions um, funding calls, you'd be part of a, a European consortium, but actually the MSA postdoctoral fellowships, so that actually is an individual grant, which is awarded to a beneficiary, for example, a university or one of the organizations here today. Now there is an, an international mobility aspect to it for the actual researcher that would partner with you, but that itself is an individual award. So, so there is a possibility, for example, if uh, Trinity and a, a researcher applied and one of the organizations here partner as an associated partner on that project. So they're like a, a collaborator and they may host the, the researcher, that kind of thing. So that's probably one of the, the outliers, if you like, in that. So yeah, that's perfect. Awesome. Great, thank you. And I think I saw Orla as well. <laughs> yeah, I just like just about Creative Europe, there are an awful lot of calls. I mean, I think it, and the media side of Creative Europe, I think there were 14 calls um, in 2021 and something similar for 2022. And many of the calls require a partner from, from application, but some of them don't. And okay. but I think that in evaluation terms, I mean, if you have a partner on board, it definitely, you know, yeah. you, it, it definitely benefits you and, and you get more points. So I, I mean, the, the calls that aren't, you know, that you don't have to have one in place. The whole idea of it is that you're looking to expand in that direction. So you might not have them on, on board at the, at the time, but that you're, you're looking to go in that direction. So it depends Perfect. on the calls. So. Okay, thank you, Orla. Aoife, did you want to pop in or did she say your point? <laughs> uh, no, um, well, kind of related, but it, similarly with the culture program, the iPortuna, so as we mentioned, that's the mobility award, but it's for individual artists and arts practitioners or cultural practitioners. Um, but in that one, it's kind of a little bit more open where you could be, for instance, um, applying to do a, a mobility like, like travel to wherever in Europe um, and it could be for a residency so it's not necessarily you know a, a partnership it's it's you're working with somebody else but it's not so much a collaboration partnership it could be just to set up that residency 
So it's still very individual. So in that way, you know, it, it's a bit more open. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think that was everybody. I didn't miss any hands there. No. Okay, great. Uh, but listen, thank you. We are, we're, we're at exactly one o'clock now. I'm just going to take one more minute just to share some of the supports that we have available. Um, uh, and I mean, all of those, we have our excellent national contact points anyway. Um, and they're definitely your kind of first protocol for any kind of expertise to do with their respective programs. And all of those details are on their slides. They'll be record, they'll be uh, disseminated in the follow up to today's session. So you'll be able to, to reach out directly to them via email and sign up to their newsletters and attend their events and have a look around their websites and everything. But just in terms of Access Europe, uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times, but we're, we provide that kind of wraparound support. If you're still not sure, or if you have an idea and you're wondering where does it belong, or you're just kind of thinking, right, how do I get started in this whole EU funding journey? That's our kind of goal is to provide that wraparound support, that kind of central hub, and then we can signpost people effectively to where, to which program they need to be at. So we do, we research all of the EU funding that's out there and we condense it into a monthly newsletter that's free. So definitely, if you're interested in getting started, sign up for that. We organize lots of free trainings and events like this one. So stay tuned for that. Again, you can sign up for, for um, updates to be kept informed about those. And then we also have our kind of one-to-one -one advice and support. So if you have a specific project idea or you're looking at how you can develop as an organization, we can organize one-to-one -one advice sessions with you as well. So do sign up to everything, follow us on Twitter. And then just to note our, our partnership platform, this is an example of um, a creative organization, Creative Lives. They're actually uh, one of their staff or speakers at our event last week. Um, or earlier on this week, I keep saying that, uh, but they're an excellent organization, really uh, experienced in EU funding. And you can see here what their profile looks like on our partner database. And it lets you upload kind of who you are, some of your essential stats, what focus area of your work, what, what does your, your everyday work focus on and what are you interested in, in terms of EU funding, a little bit about your experience. If you don't have any experience, don't worry. It automatically includes a note that everybody on the database will be supported by Access Europe. So when we're promoting this to Europe, it can be reassuring to partners that, you know, each, each organization will be supported throughout the process of the project. And then it lets you outline your funding goals and your strengths. And, you know, part of this is uploading your profile so that we can send it out into Europe and hopefully you can be invited into projects. And that's a nice way to kind of gradually build your capacity before you take on a coordinating role but it's also an exercise in and of itself just taking the time to sit down and do your do your profile and think well what are our EU funding goals what do we actually want to achieve through this and what are our strengths what can we bring to a project and what are we looking for you know these kinds of questions are really important because I think what we've illustrated today is that it's not kind of an ad hoc funding EU funding it's something that you think about strategically over a number of years and you kind of weave into your strategy and uh, you kind of think about it as a, as a gradual building of your capacity. So it's all about kind of, I suppose, starting an EU funding journey. So sometimes that first step can be sitting down and, and building your profile and thinking about what you even want from this journey to begin with. And then you can feel free to come and chat to us and we can help to try and push you in the right direction. Um, so that's everything that we have from everybody today. So thank you so much to all of our fantastic speakers, absolutely wonderful. And just so, we're so lucky in Ireland to have such great contact points who were so helpful and open. Um, apologies for going over a little bit, but we leave it there and let everybody go off for their lunch. Um, and we'll be in touch soon uh, with the follow-up. Okay, so thanks very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.